that's pretty shocking yeah. that you lost 16 pounds on average, 16 pounds of fat and went up 3.7 pounds of mu- of lean. I keep saying lean, not muscle. Everyone would take that. Bringing you a reasoned approach to health and fitness. This is the Fi Life Podcast. Welcome to the Fi Life Podcast. I'm John Barber, and with me is Brad Pilon. And today we're going to talk about, um, well, a, an article came my way about uh, the various companies that are producing Ozempic and Terzepatide in the, the weight loss GLP-1 receptor GLP-1 agonists. GLP-1 agonist weight loss. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and, and, and there's been some um, information or, or some lines of evidence suggesting that with the dramatic weight loss they're seeing with these with these drugs, there's uh, part of that weight loss is lean mass loss, as measured by you know DEXA. If that's if we're going to call that an accurate measurement, um, now me and Brad maintain, and we've have we have data on this. We have data on this that, as again measured by DEXA, that if you're yeah. working out while you're on one of these drugs and you lose weight, you don't lose any lean mass. It and makes again, me want to bash my head against the mm-hmm. wall, right? Because we've yeah. also we talked about the way back the biggest loser trial. And those people losing some lean mass and being like, yeah, but they had massive amounts of lean mass because it mm. was internal viscera and food, et cetera. Yeah. And the one guy they were showing who was, I think we just talked about this, who was five foot 10, my height, and lost tons of lean mass and still ended up with like 20 more pounds of lean mass than I have. So it's so context-based, but also to your point is that if they were training, they wouldn't lose lean mass and... Again, if they were not on any of these drugs and were dieting but not training, they would also lose lean mass. It seems like such a weird thing to hang your hat on there. Yeah, in that discussion, they just completely dismissed the idea that diet, just a hard caloric diet in the absence of anabolics, you're going to lose some lean mass. Regard- like even the data I presented in that other episode, um, I mean, I was on TRT. Like yeah. I'm on a fixed level of testosterone, not like yeah. some huge number, but like I'm, I'm – don't – I'm high normal. I'm a, I got myself, I'm usually right around 900, a thousand when I measure. Mm-hmm. So it's not like I'm wanting for, uh, the anabolic effect of testosterone and, or there is some idea that if you diet really hard, your natural testosterone could drop, right? Some of right. the anabolic, yep. some of the anabolic machinery might be inhibited during caloric restriction. We don't know, but maybe anyways, not my case. And I still, I couldn't hold lean mass like on a diet as much as I'd have liked to when I got into my leanest, leanest condition. So, right, right. So, I mean, maybe I didn't train hard enough. Maybe I wasn't experienced enough to know how to push really hard. I mean, I, was, I thought I was training hard, but maybe there were, I probably could have maybe preserved another pound or two. Yeah. But either way, I even lost like, what well, was it, about five pounds. So, mm-hmm. um, so, anyways, so these companies, I think, are realizing this is a, a confounding thing with the weight loss. And, um, they're starting to, well, they've already been looking at drugs to mini, uh, mitigate the lean mass loss. And the thing, the, the interesting thing here is it costs a lot of money. I don't know if this is where you're going. It costs a lot of money to produce, to research and produce a drug, like like hundreds of millions of dollars. A new drug too. A Not an existing <clears throat> one that a lot of people are on that would have mm-hmm. the same effect, but a brand new drug that way it's patented. Right. Yeah. And so they're already banking on the fact that no one's going to lift weights. And, and no banking one's... on the fact that like half the population is going to be on these drugs in five years. Right. Right. Yeah. But they already know, like we know, and if you're listening, you probably have an, some idea that, well, you could preserve that lean mass and even gain it by working out and lifting weights. But these pharmaceutical companies, no one's going to lift weights. Yeah. Like, so you gonna... have clients who are on <clears throat> Ozempic who are training and are doing just fine with their lean mass. Because right, mm-hmm. they're working out. So, but, yep. but since you can't patent working out, you're kind of left. And you can't patent testosterone because someone else owns. That's probably past patent now. Well, at, at, something right. New. Well, at the clinic. Oh, right. We're brought to you by the Total T Clinic. And at the oh, clinic, of which, yeah. at the clinic, um, people who are using, they you can get semaglutide or terzepatide, but even even it's there. It's hard for them to. Eat. I mean, we we do like give them a workout, give them counseling on it. It's just really hard to convince people who've never had the workout thing built in since high school or college. It's super hard to get them to start. So overall, I think there's still a benefit to losing uh, body fat, even if some lean mass comes down with it. And as 
as per Brad's earlier comment, we don't actually know if they just have too much lean mass. Yeah. It, like it's, if they're yeah. too big. Anyways, the point is, it's really hard to convince someone to work out who just doesn't have it built into them from a younger age. Right. And, and these pharmaceutical companies kind of understand that because it's a big gamble to put that much money into um, this type of drug if it, there's no market for it on the other side. Yeah, yeah. especially for lean mass. Like it, that hasn't been a target of pharma in forever. Right. right. Like, because the, if you think about sarcopenia, which is the, the lean mass <laughs> loss with aging, which is a major contributor <clears throat> to um, quality of life and mortality in the elderly, that wasn't big enough for them <laughs> to look into it. Right. Like that was not important enough for them to be like, we need new drugs. But knowing that these new weight loss drugs are going to potentially cause because I haven't even seen data on them actually causing lean muscle loss either but just based on that concept they're like yeah we need a drug for this is is pretty interesting yeah i don't think there's any data showing that okay so on semaglutide or, or terzepatide well, we're just going to keep saying semaglutide meaning all of those types yeah so on semaglutide if if you do lose some lean mass it's not like it's any different than if those people just just dieted without the semaglutide and lost the same amount of total right. body body weight you're yeah. likely going to arrive at the same proportion of all things being equal, right? Like not like with or without working out. Like let's say all the people did the exact same thing. And let's say they, a bunch of people on semaglutide and a bunch of people not on semaglutide all dieted and got down 25, 30 pounds, whatever the number is. Right. The ratio is going to be the same. The only reason they're talking about it with sem semaglutide is because it's actually working. And like yeah. lots of people are seeing results. Lots. You know what, what I would I would I would <clears throat> accept if the lean mass loss came with some sort of degeneration of lean mass. So if we were to see in semiglutide users an increase in um, tears, muscle tears or muscle strains, and it's like, oh yeah, that some we're affecting the physiology of the muscle. It's not just getting smaller because these people are, are eating less or, or weighing less, it's actually fundamentally changing the muscle, then that may require an intervention, right? Mm -hmm. Because then they can't, maybe they couldn't work out. But since we haven't seen that, as far as I know, either, it seems like such a weird thing to yeah, focus I, on. I, I mean, yeah. Anyways, so <laughs> so uh, someone sent me an article about, about one of these drugs being studied and that at some of the companies that produce, I think Lily and... Um, the, the two major companies that produce these GLP-1 receptor agonists are in the process of purchasing other companies or partnering with other pharmaceutical companies that are studying drugs that somehow can preserve lean mass. Now, this one's interesting. So this, this, so we're going to review this study. It, it's about this drug called Bim, <laughs> Say <the name>. Bim, <laughs> Bimagrumab. Bimagrumab. Yeah. Bimagrumab. Anyways, and it's it's being used to study like fat loss versus a placebo in type 2 diabetics um, with obesity. Now, I I couldn't figure out the mechanism of action for fat loss. It's an antibody, right? It's a monoclonal antibody that blocks the myostatin receptor pathway. So the active in 2 receptor. The active yeah. in 2 receptor. Okay, so myostatin. I mean, how, where do we even start with this? All right, so myostatin, again, I think we talked about this before. If you look it up online, myostatin knockout... Um, animals you'll see like a, a cow or a dog that just is e enormously muscled and this is myostatin um is is the compound that tells your muscles to stop growing so if you if you inhibit your genetic muscle set point if you were right if you will there's, yeah. well, there's a reason why we don't just grow forever like why do people <laughs> just stop getting bigger right mm -hmm. like we obviously when you see when you see a, a three or four year old kid you don't really think well that's it they're not going to get any like you understand they're going to keep getting bigger but then when we get to like you know maturity we stop so why there's there's all kinds of genetic factors that tell like why is your left arm stop growing in your why do they why are your arms are the same length why same why length. is it yeah. one twice the size of the other right there's yeah there's genetic factors that tell your body okay that's the, all these things stop now so myostatin, that's what myostatin does for your skeletal muscle, at least as far as we know. There may be other factors in there, but that's the one yeah. we, we, we're pretty sure about. And if you uh, get rid of it, like in these animals, they seem to grow enormously huge, but just specifically skeletal muscle. So it's not like they get 
taller or the bones get bigger, the muscle itself gets bigger. And this isn't in uh, androgen, like a testosterone or some sort of anabolic agent. It's literally turning off the off signal by blocking myostatin. Myostatin is the stop signal, and then we're just getting rid of that. But it's not a anabolic signal like a testosterone, correct? You're right. It's it's yeah. the it's stopping the off single signal, right? So, and that's always going on. Like you can is you can eventually. It's not like it stops once. Like it still needs to be present, right? So, mm-hmm. um, all right. So they, again, I'm still not 100 percent sure. I think p- maybe part of the mechanism is if you preserve muscle mass or it even grows, that theoretically can in- increase um, insulin sensitivity, which then in turn can improve blood blood glucose regulation now, your muscles is, would be a massive dumping spot for glucose so maybe that's right maybe that's why. And, and so some of the background research in this paper that arrives at this concept is does show there is a correlation between muscle mass and insulin sensitivity and again this paper is like about yeah, that makes two, sense type 2 diabetes right so if you have more active muscle theoretically that is like brad said it's a sink for blood glucose to be cleared which then right. should help with diabetics clearing blood glucose so if you just didn't have as much muscle or it wasn't as metabolically active that's just one less place for the blood glucose to clear so now all you got is your liver and some fat right so it's just yeah. or if i have how... twice as much muscle as you i have twice as much sink for glucose exactly right so okay. so this theory here i think is that if we can preserve active muscle or even grow it and make it more insulin sensitive but without working out because that's hard. <laughs> well, I mean, oh, all of the working out does all of this. This is yeah. just to do it without. Again, I think these companies realize no one's going to work out. All of these effects you just get from weight training. But if people don't weight train, they're just not going to weight train. So how do we re- really? We're trying to dr- drug induce the effect of weight training is what without this is using steroids. Right, right. Like I still don't understand yeah. why people that are wasting they don't give them testosterone. Yeah, you know, like it's funny. I, I made fun of it, but I now I think BIM was you was first being developed for use in people over seventy, and I don't know why they stopped. But to get to your point again, I don't know why blocking myostatin is a more interesting concept than slightly increasing testosterone. I'd love to dig into well, why they do that. Okay, so I have notes here before we get into the paper. I have notes that they've tried this before, and I'm going to butcher the name of this one. Stamulumab. What is with the names? What kind of names are these? Anyways, so dumb. We're just going to call the one we're talking about BIM and that one's STAM. So yeah, when they, 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 they tried this, this was a, yeah. They tried, <laughs> they tried this in 2005, six with, they made it from phase, they made it all the way to a phase two trial with this okay. previous, previous myostatin inhibitor. Do we need to explain phase one, phase two trials? Phase three? Um, let's just say they made it to humans. They made yeah, it past better, the yeah. petri dish, past the animals, made it to humans. Yes, right. Which is that's phase two, right? So, but anyways, not thousands of humans, like a hundred. No, like studies. hundreds, right? Yeah, yeah. still big. Um, <clears throat> so, right, yeah, yeah. Phase three is when it gets real big, right? And yeah. <clears throat> phase four is like post market once it's on the market. So, yeah. anyways, so it didn't really work. So, and they they <laughs> postulate that it was too. Like, they didn't get much result in, like, lean mass, like, being affected. Like, just kind of what they were hoping for just wasn't obvious. So there's right. something going on here that worked in animals that didn't work in people. Oh, yeah, that's another thing. It seemed to work in certain animal models, like mice Everything and a few other things. Everything seemed to work in animal models, yeah. so, right? Like- so I remember having a professor, professor when we were talking about research. Um, the one retort to all the researchers who uh, study animals is, yeah. well, but what does this mean in humans? And then, the, and then the retort the other way, when you see something that humans are studying, they would say, but what does this mean in animals? Yeah. Because that's their research. Anyways. Yeah. But you have to well, go I remember the- my, under, my undergrad was, um, my undergrad thesis was on CLA, conjugated linoleic acid. Yeah. And man, if, if that worked in humans the way it worked in mice, it, we'd all be massive. But it just doesn't work that way usually. Yeah. I mean, they're a decent model, but again, their physiology is not exact. So, yeah, which is why we but, go phase one, phase two, phase three. Yeah. Right. You got, and, and you, you, I mean, unfortunately for the animals, but kind of good for us, you use the animals to find what the lethal dose is and toxicity yeah. and all of that stuff before you ever, ever try it in a person. So that's the progression. Anyways, this is not what we're talking about. Um, no. The point is, they tried this with the myostatin inhibitor before, it didn't work for some reason. It just, I think they postulated they were too specific and they were learning that the receptors they're 
blocking, there's kind of more pathways than they thought. And there's more different hormones binding than they thought. And they're kind of, they're like, they're on the dartboard, but they're not on the bullseye. They might, they're getting close and they thought they were on it, but they're not right on it. So they're, right. they're, okay. they're in the ballpark. So come to 2017, BIM, short form for the, the full drug name is being studied for this exact same thing. So I, they, I think, I think they think they've got a better concept now. Um, this drug might bind to more locations, bind uh, more readily, longer. I don't know. It, it's like a, it's an almost 20 day half-life, right? Yeah. And it wasn't yeah. super clear why, why this one's so much different than Stam, the old one, but obviously they were confident in this one. Um, and I guess it must've shown better results in animals to bother going this far after seeing right. something similar fail so badly 10, 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. Um, so this is a phase two trial in two, two, nine different sites between the United States and the United Kingdom. Explain um, that. So a bunch of different universities working together, different universities working together. Um, you usually have a trial coordinator who's, uh, my advi uh, grad advisor was a trial coordinator like this. And it, it's, it's it's complicated getting all of these sites like it's, there's a lot of cross communication going on but anyways it's it's this is a big one so you got yeah. nine sites going uh big in that there's multiple sites but it actually wasn't that many total people multiple um, sites is cool though because it, it helps remove the biases of if it was all done in toronto and you're like yeah but it was right. just a bunch of canadian students this is like yeah i would like we've ruled out the lo location biases and the mm -hmm. proximity biases yeah Right. Well, and this this definitely wasn't students. These people's average age was, I think, sixty. But, anyways, so um, now it took two years to do this. It went from February twenty seventeen to May twenty nineteen, and that they only actually collected data on about seventy people. And of how and many? The, seventy. No, out of how many people signed up, or is that that's the oh, amount? I'll get I'll get to that. They recruited three hundred and twenty two. Oh, interesting. That's in what I'm order for. to okay. just get seventy. We'll get to that in a second. Yeah. That's actually pretty interesting. Uh, now, the trial length is 48 weeks. So you might be wondering, what, why did it take two, two years if it's only 48 weeks? The thing is, not everyone starts on day one. Like, people come right. in periodically, like, throughout, periodically throughout the two years. Right. Uh, it's, if, it's hard. Like, when, when I was in you grad school. You have so school, many grad students, right? So Yeah. And when yeah. I was in grad school, I was, we were running one leg of a four-year trial. So during, like, we were, like, in wow. the clinic for a year of a four-year, like, by that, like, we showed up, and that trial was still going, and we left, and that trial was still going, like, because huh. it, it just took so long to get to the number of people, because you get dropouts, it's hard to get people who fit your exclusion criteria, right, it's just, right. so whenever you see a paper, and, and the trial was, like, even if it says 12 weeks or 20 weeks, that probably took a couple years, to, depending it on how many people are in it, it's yeah. not all at once, those people all don't start at once. That would actually would be really hard. Just depending on your manpower, it would be hard to have everyone show up all at once. You probably couldn't yeah. even do it. Um, so you had some exclu So they had to be diabetic. They had to be 18 to 75 years old. You know, their, their glycated, uh, glycated hemoglobin, HbA1c, was between 6.5 and 10%. That's, okay, up, that's way up wow. there. Like these are diabetics, like for yeah. sure. Uncontrolled um, diabetics, actually, too, right? Like it's, that's pretty high. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah that's, that's high. Uh, they're no, they're actually on certain meds. They're on certain meds, but no, they have to be okay. they have to be static throughout this trial. They can't change their meds, obviously. Gotcha. Okay. Otherwise, you mess the whole trial up. Yeah. Their BMIs, their starting BMI were between twenty eight and forty. Oh, it's pretty, okay. It's pretty big on the on yeah. the high side. That's high. And the and the body weights were between sixty five kilograms and one hundred and forty kilograms. So if you want to switch oh. that, if you want to switch that to pounds, that's that tops out at like three hundred and ten pounds. Something like that. That's yeah. That's that's a lot. Um, and I mean sixty right. Three hundred eight. Yeah, yeah. That's good. Three, 308. It's a yeah. lot, right? It's good. Fighting so rate. and I'll get to I'll get to the average. That's just that's just what they say is was the range of people. Right um, now, there's, this is a mix of men and women. So obviously, well, maybe not obviously, but uh, but in this case, it seems like the men brought that average up a bit, and some of the women were um, on the smaller side here. But again, if your BMI is bet twenty eight between 28 and 40, not too many people can be that light, no matter how short they are like, yeah, no. for, to be in that BMI. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, geez. 
so they had an upper body weight restriction of 140 kgs. So obviously people were responding to this who were over 308 pounds. Oh, wow. So they, they capped it out. Yeah. And then the dose of the drug is per per kilogram body weight up to a oh. maximum up to a maximum of the of the 120 kg number. So anyone who was heavier than 100 whatever that is 200 was that 80 pounds or something like that? Yeah. They just didn't keep going with the drug per kilogram measurement. They just That's capped far, it. They just capped it. So they so okay. that means the to, the maximum dose you could even get was 1200 milligrams. Even though theoretically they someone at How 140 often? Once every four weeks yeah, via, okay, yeah. via yeah. an intravenous 30 minute intravenous infusion. And then, the, and oh, then with, okay. with, uh, mm, uh, with a dextrose solution. So, and then the placebo just got the intravenous infusion of dextrose minus the drug. Right. 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 So, right. so very, so from a placebo end of it, I mean, you're getting something put right into your veins. Like you can, you, if you're in the placebo group, the procedure feels very real. It's not like yes, you can which tell. Is, which is really important, by the way. It is important, yeah, because you're like, all right, they they tap, they put something right into me. Like that's, I felt that go in. Like this is, I, it'd be really hard for them to guess if they weren't on the drug. Yes. Um, uh, see, yeah, that's so key. Right? You can't just open a pill yeah. and look and see who's got the brown powder, who's got the white. Yeah, powder. which we've experienced. We've experienced yep. people like fiddling with their supplements, trying to figure out if they were in the uh, in the in the placebo group or not. You could never do that here. So you could yeah. say with good certainty there's no way to guess which group you're in here um now the other thing so we're, we're i'm purposely walking you through what it's like to even be in a trial to yeah. show how how foreign and different this is from just normal everyday living to impress upon you like is any of this transferable like the way these the what these people are going to be experiencing for the next 48 weeks you've never if you haven't been in a trial You've never, this is just completely unlike Real any, 40, any 48 weeks of your life. Like just yeah. no way. Um, okay. So they, they were, they met with a registered dietitian every month during, during the trial. In addition, they had virtual visits in between those monthly in-person visits. Zoom meeting kind of thing, basically. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, think think about that much of attention. Like, I, I'm sure there's programs you can buy online like that that are really expensive, but most people won't pay for. Yeah. But these people are getting this type of attention for 48 straight weeks in order to try and to. Go ahead. Like you're discussing your diet, and that's something, and probably your weight, right? So that the conversation is probably like, "Hello, Mr. X. You know, it's, it's it's great to see you. We want to talk about what you ate this week. Um, did you have you weighed in? What was your weight? And uh, and then it's that like I'm now I'm being judged by. You know, this person or this this person on Zoom, and so shoot, they're going to review what I ate this week. So I better eat. Uh, I'm going to have some berries before we meet. Like it, yeah. it, it, it's an intervention already. It's impossible to separate out the human element of knowing someone's going to ask you how you ate and did you stick to your diet yeah. protocol here. Which yeah. okay, so they had so 24 hour diet recalls, which are terrible because yeah. most people can't remember what they ate. It it, it sounds ridiculous. But if, if you right now try to figure out what you ate, it, all of the things you ate in the last 24 hours, most people will forget. Yeah, something. something. They won't get yeah. it all. They won't get it all. And on that note, they were asked to follow a calorie-restricted diet. 500 calories. Now, this, is, this wording is very important. Okay, yeah, hit me here. 500-calorie daily reduction. What do you think that means? 500-calorie daily reduction. So they yeah, would yeah. reduce their... Total daily calories by 500, but what was their starting number? I guess is what I would exactly. Want. What's yeah. their starting number? Yeah. If they're if you're eating, I mean, some of these people are over 300 pounds, right? Yeah. The average. Okay, let me let me. So uh, as um, as something that's instructive, I, I looked at the average starting body weight. The average. Let's see here. Starting body weight was 205 pounds. Okay. Across this group of people, um, and again, the BMIs are all in in the overweight or obese category, right? So that means they've been eating kind of a lot. Um, at, you know, the complications with diabetes, not with, notwithstanding, it's obviously there's other things going on metabolically, but you just can't get to 300 yeah. pounds eating maintenance, or you got to no. eat a lot of food to get there, right? And so, you have to maintain that weight. Yeah. So yeah. if they're asked to eat 500 calories daily reduction. 
if they're eating more than 500 calories in an excess, this reduction yeah. might only get them to maintenance. It's not going to get them to lose weight. Cause, cause again, they didn't say 500 calories. Re- yeah. Lower, it's really weird. Right. They didn't say 500 calories less than your daily calculated maintenance for your height and, and muscle mass. There's right? no, no supplementary data on that or anything. Jeez. No, that's just what they say. That's like lousy. Right. But yeah. if that, um, if, if they're being forthright with how they're explaining it in this trial, that's all we can go on. So they were just, they were instructed. And now we'll, the results will reveal what this really was. Right, right. And regardless what they say they did, the results tell us what they did. But I think that's it. Just try to eat 500 less. First of all, you think these people knew what they were eating in the first place? How yeah, did they I mean, even it's know? It's a lot to ask that nutritionist or dietitian right. for. Like right there. And this is just a th- this is one line in the dis- in the trial procedures, and this could be the crux of the whole thing, and it's just one line, and it's just asked to eat 500 calories less, less than what? Did did they have a good idea of how many calories they were ever eating in the first place? Like how did they? Right. How do they really know? The minute they're enrolled in the trial, did they already change their diet, knowing they're going to be and in that a was diet my trial? Thing, 500 under a low number. That's the other option, right? Well, it's probably not under any number that got them to these it, these sizes like these body weights to begin with. So yeah. 500 under what? So like that's, I mean, and this is where diet and nutrition research breaks down like really quickly is like, okay, 500 under what? Like what, what were they eating? Yeah. Did they, did they really know how to track it was this? 500 to begin under with? always, or is it, well, okay, I went for a walk today. So it's 500 even slightly higher. Like, yeah. Hmm. How, how, that's, that's, that's just not, that's just, you know what though? On the other hand, that's probably how they were going to function in real life. Just try to eat 500 that's calories true. less. Yeah. And like a lot of people, that that's what they read online. Like, all right, I, I don't know. I don't even know what I do, but I'll try to like, it's how do you even know to go 500? Anyways, it's, I found that kind of like, that's really loose. Like, how do you, you can't quantify this at all. Also, as we said, we've got people uh, as light as 65 kgs and as big as 140 kgs. You're telling Pretty me good spread. 500 calories is standard for all those people? Yeah. Really? Like, I don't know. Okay. Like yeah. larger men, smaller women, 500 across the board. Yeah, all we right. already talked about that. Yeah, does, I like does, for for a woman that could reduce multiple meals a day to half a yogurt and half a banana. And for a 300-pound <laughs> man, that could lower it down to a 12-inch sub every cup. Like it's... Well, that's yeah, really that, hard for every woman. Yeah. That's way harder for every than, than every man because they're just bigger. Yeah. They have more muscle mass. They're just bigger. All right, so, I mean, you just that's a whole nother talk. Anyways, yeah, yeah. Um, suffice to say, the all they were told was five hundred less, and there doesn't really seem to be any more detail than that. Okay. Um, and they were told, you know, like do forty to fifty percent carbs, twenty to twenty five percent protein, thirty percent fat. Like this, come it's on, standard. no one, no, yeah, yeah, no one's going to be able to measure that. And think about this: they were told to do that for forty eight weeks. You're going to eat 500 calories less than I don't know what for 48 weeks? For 48 Im- weeks. Nope. Yeah. Impossible. Participants received counseling for physical activity and were encouraged to follow the American Diabetes Association walking program. So not weight training, nothing. I think purposely, they don't want them to weight train. What is counseling for diet? Like just, hey, you should go work out? Like it's... I don't know. But physical activity, I don't know. Just Just yeah. to go walk. Just to walk. Well, you know what? If you're training someone... At least on the higher end of this, you don't do much before. No, that's pretty much all you do, right? Anyone I've ever dealt with at that size, we just start walking for a while before we're ready to do anything, right? So so that's fair. So the endpoints were total body fat mass, a bunch of other measurements. They did Mm -hmm. did a lot of body composition measurements with like DEXA and MRIs for hepatic fat storage, like fat stored in your liver and stuff. Lots of stuff like lipid, C-reactive protein, like just all the stuff you would think of. Um, right. So that that was that was good. That was a really good piece of this trial. They were really comprehensive with how they measured things. So let's get further along here. So the the endpoints were a reduction in body fat mass was the main endpoint, but then along with that, what happened with lean mass? That was like the whole. That's like really what they were most interested in here. Yeah. Okay, let's get to the let's get to the results section here. So, um, a total decrease of body fat mass of tw- of t- almost twenty one percent of body fat mass, not body fat percentage of body fat mass. So that's a lot. 
That is a, so that's like, a good loss. Yeah, that's a lot. Um, now, the interesting thing is, so that was that was in the 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 BIM group. And the placebo, it was 0.5%. So this is where I'm getting at with the eat 500 calories less. That for sure wasn't a deficit because 48 weeks later, they weighed the same. Yeah. Well, sorry. Sorry. Let me Let me correct that. They didn't weigh the same. Their body fat mass was the same. So they didn't lose any fat. Right. So 48 weeks later, being told to eat 500 calories less, even if they did it, which I highly doubt they managed to do, they nothing changed. Or What was the they, um, or, comparison oh, between ahead. the two? The comparison between the two. So I was yawning there. Um, like in terms of, I always want to know, It's it always strikes me as fascinating if the BIM group's after picture or after fat mass is somehow still higher than the placebo groups before. That oh, kind of yeah, yeah. Well, let's see here. That's actually a good question. I have to look. I wonder if they even categorize that because they do show the change. So the we BIM did the math group backwards. Yeah. Yeah. The BIM group lost like 7.5 kilograms, which is, I don't know, like 14 pounds or so, more okay. than 14 pounds. BIM was 7.5? 7.5 kgs uh, on average. Now they have like yeah. highs and lows and stuff, but, yeah, and yeah. then the, and then the placebo point. 1.8 kilograms. Okay. So just so like, not, that's just an error. That's just a measurement error. That's whatever, 0.3 pounds. Like you can just drink, drink some water and you're up 0.3 pounds. Yeah. Um, and then, so they have some numbers as to how many people lost how much like throughout. Uh, let's see here. Okay. So that's, that's, that's it for that. So the, okay. So <clears throat> something more about who these people were, the mean age was 60 years old. Okay. R ranging from 46 to 73. Something really odd, and this is with... Okay, so if you've ever done or heard of a randomized trial, the idea is you like you randomly select people to go in each side, like placebo um, treatment group, placebo treatment. And when you have all your people who even pass your criteria, from there, you you can't pick yourself. Like you do a random selection, right? So they randomly land on either side, as to remove your bias. Because you, even though you, like, why do you care? You're just, you still can have a yeah. bias. So they're trying to get rid of that too. <clears throat> so with even that built in, somehow twenty three women ended up on one side and twelve on the other. That's weird. So and then why would you accept that? I know, yeah. right? But it's truly random. I don't know. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I guess. I guess one shuffle of the cards, you could get all women on one side. Yeah. And you just say, well, I don't know. We did it randomly. But that seems ridiculous, <laughs> especially like because it could throw this yeah. off a little the bit. The total body fat mass did start as averages <laughs> roughly the same. The error bars are huge. So it's not like one group dropped mm -hmm. a whole bunch, but was still higher than the other in fat mass. Just right, yeah, right. Okay. Got it. Um, yes, right, 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 right. So... Um, Let's see what where, uh, where else are we here? Oh, there was something interesting about some of the exclusions. Oh, hit me. Uh, oddly, okay, so with with the people who, so they they recruited three hundred and twenty two people. Um, seventy five were randomized to end up with I think fifty eight people completing the Ooh, study. So we had some size lot of, during the the trial. Then it's a lot of a it's a lot of attrition, yeah. right? So, I mean, the, one of the major reasons was uh, HbA1c levels were out of range. 73 people were excluded. So I don't know if they were even higher than 10% or lower right. or on, on either side. Yeah. So, so they actually took a while out of 322 just to get down to 58. So it, took, it was hard to get people like, that fit the criteria here. Okay. But really, I made a little note here of something interesting. 27 men didn't meet the criteria because of low testosterone. Interesting. So, now we know that's related to being obese, right? Um, we see that often, and then we know but, that it's related to diabetes because we wrote a book on it. Um, but they didn't know that. Twenty-seven men found out they had low testosterone right here. Oh, wow! And they—that was before. Otherwise, uh, that was excluded before the seventy-three, not after. Well, they would if they knew they had low testosterone. They were already. They wouldn't have even tried to enroll. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. So 27 guys were like, oh, geez, I have low testosterone. And they find out right here when they get excluded from this trial. Right. So I just thought that was like instructive. Like that was, it's about eight, eight, nine percent of, the, yeah. of the 73. How many men? 27. And then we're starting with 300 people. So out of a probably have 150 half men, men half 27. 
So it's almost it's it's pushing nineteen percent, twenty percent of of the men that showed up got excluded and for low testosterone. And not all the men were. I mean, assuming if we go down to sixty five kilograms, some of these men were overweight, like at the twenty eight BMI. So it would be really curious to tease out of those ones who. Oh well, like yeah, how many of them yeah. were? That's a whole study. That's a oh, whole yeah. study right there. Yeah. Like where where on the on the body weight scale, were, obese versus just overweight yeah. were these twenty seven guys? Yeah. Either way, that just struck me as like, that wow, that many guys really just happen to have low testosterone. So that might be indicative of like a wider thing going on in the population. Especially in men with, I mean, they knew they had high HbA1c, right? Right. So yeah. So right. Di- yeah. overweight, diabetic. Yeah, they had. To, they had to, just to get just to get to this point. They had to be overweight and diabetic within, hopefully, within that range. Mm. Well, hopefully, unfortunately, in that range, I guess. Um, yeah. So, I mean. The starting body fat mass on average was seventy eight pounds of fat. Right, That's real. So that is... I mean, when, when you do the when you do the averages here, seventy eight pounds. pounds was the av- are, no, seventy eight kilos or pounds. Pounds. Okay, so uh, thirty five thirty five kilos child, of fat, seventy eight pounds. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. Like at one of my bigger dexes that we talked about, I was at thirty five pounds. Right. At at nineteen percent body fat. So they, these people are. Like average double my highest, so that's. But again, at these, at you know, at these BMIs, all the way up to forty, that's kind of what you would expect. Yeah, I mean, it's just this is the category we're in. This is the whole reason why semaglutide exists, and they're studying can this can these people lose weight with this yep. with this drug? Um, all right, so let's get to the actual results. Mm-hmm. So, like we said, they lost on average sixteen pounds of fat mass. Right. Not not fat percentage of actual mass. So like. If the average was 78 pounds, they came down closer to 60-ish on average. Yeah, okay. And the placebo group, no, nothing. Like, literally nothing happened. Um, now, so that, that just tells me they ate basically to caloric maintenance the whole time. They didn't, and which group was predominantly it, women? Oh, that's a good question. Um, the the uh, intervention <laughs> that people got the drug yeah. were predominantly women. Okay. So, all right. So, which is actually kind of impressive because if it was the men having a, probably a wider variance yeah. could push those numbers even further, yeah. right? Like if you have one or two guys at 300 pounds, you have really good results, but the women are kind of shorter and they're just less total. The number is just smaller on the women because the women in generally are smaller. The guys could influence this more, but yeah. either way, it's just odd that there was twice as many women almost in yeah. the, in the intervention group. It just seems like they got to redo this. Yeah. Um, Anyways, so on average, 16-ish pounds of, of uh, fat mass loss, which is kind of a – that's pretty good. That's pretty yeah. good. Uh, and then lean mass, so uh, again, as per measured by DEXA, so we can't say definitively if this is just muscle. Right. But we're going to just take DEXA for all its strength and weaknesses. Lean mass went up 3.7 pounds on average. And these are people who were just told to go went for a walk. up from their – Existing number or compared to the placebo group? Good question. No, existing. Okay. Mm-hmm. And let me guess, placebo went down slightly. One pound. Okay, so this is this is my thing. I know, I know, I know. You're gonna say so. The so the delta is four point seven yeah. pounds. I know. It's it sounds which shifty. which is just so okay. Had this been a supplement company launching a new form of amino acid? And I'm like, hey, guys, check out my results. Mm-hmm. I got 3.7 pounds of increase. People are like, that's that the argument would have been that could have easily been done with diet and exercise. I'm like, yeah, but no, but it's actually a 400% increase because the placebo group lost a pound. And that's when you'd be get, you would get yelled at because it's happened for manipulating data and an unjust mm-hmm. use of statistical analysis and uh, but but here it's fine so i just no yeah. here no 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 that's that's just the absolute value yeah. so the the bim group the intervention group gained on average 3.7 pounds of lean mass as per measured by dexa yeah. which you know take take it for what its weak strengths and weaknesses are and then the placebo group lost a pound of lean mass which how does that happen yeah um but I guess you could say they're in the placebo and this type of condition when you have – you're in a overweight or obese BMI and you have diabetes as defined by 
HbA1c 6.5 all the way up to 10. Like that's that's legit. Like you're there. Did the um, HbA1c could... improve in the BIM group? Oh, yeah. 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 So well, that's interesting. I wonder. I wonder that we always talk well, about that, how that's part of it. Muscle improves insulin sensitivity, but I wonder if insulin sensitivity improves the ability to build muscle. Right? Like it's. Well, that's the debate. It's back yeah, and yeah. forth. It could be both. Yeah. And this drug, this drug could also have a direct, some sort of direct effect that has nothing to do with the muscle mass or the weight loss. That's true. Yeah. Because because they found these receptors on like fat tissue and other tissues. Yeah. So just because it might be blocking the receptors at the muscle and maybe the muscle isn't shrinking anymore and actually can grow a bit in the absence of weight training, they're just going for walks. That's all they're doing. Yeah. So, um, but, but, okay. So HbA1c improved by uh, 0.76%. So that's pretty good. So they became now, less with, diabetic, I guess, if you want a layman's term it. Or more controlled, guess, better, right. better controlled diabetics. Better controlled. Placebo, nothing happened. Right. And, and you wouldn't expect nope, it, right? Nope. You wouldn't expect it. Um, so, yeah. So, that I mean... Those are pretty, that's pretty, like, that's pretty shocking yeah. that you lost 16 pounds, on average, 16 pounds of fat and went up 3.7 pounds of mu of lean, I keep saying lean, not muscle. Everyone would take that. Everyone would take that yep. across the and board. And that's not, uh, just to be clear, <laughs> they weren't taking this drug plus semiglutide. This is that drug on its own, mm -hmm. a potential myostatin inhibitor somehow causing fat loss on top of muscle gain, right? Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, again, mechanism's not obvious because, I mean, if it's just, is the muscle, okay, so is that change in lean mass causing that much insulin sensitivity to change yeah. such that um, their HbA1c improved, but then somehow they still lost 16 pounds of And fat? I just looked up the supplementary data and they did measure hand grip strength. And the, yeah. the BIM group's hand group hand grip strength was substantially lower than the placebo, but that's probably because of the gender differences in the two groups. But the BIM group saw a improvement in hand grip by I'm assuming these are Newtons. Oh, lower than the you mean to start? Yeah. So the, the give you an idea. The, yeah, Newtons right. BIM, BIM group was like it started at 265, and the placebo group started at 345 on their left hand. And then right group 279. Hey, hey. Random. Randomized. Yeah. Uh, so that's a bit interesting. But the, the BIM group went up in both left hand and right hand. And the placebo group went down in both left hand and right hand. So they did not only just mm -hmm. see an increase in muscle. They saw an increase in mun muscle function. Now, I don't know if they were training. Um, it's so vague on what they were doing. If they were training. No, nah, they, they just said they went for walks. It didn't say anything about training. Yeah. Um, that's, but it's... Yeah. I always find it suspicious when placebo not only doesn't change, but gets worse, worse in the measured yeah. metrics. It's just like, even though they know on, they're in really? a trial, but right. Like, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Um, now another interesting thing. Now this was side research that wasn't the full. So I, during a trial, like let's, okay. So there was whatever, 58 people or, that completed this. Some amount of people agreed to other measurements, but not all of them. So, like, you have a little side group of, like, 25 people who's like, oh, yeah, we can do these other measurements. They'll let, right. let themselves do the right. other measurements. So one of them was um, MRI of hepatic fat fraction, like how much percent fat is in your liver, okay. which is kind of important for metabolic health. And that actually improved big time in the uh, BIM That's group. That's good. So, yeah, they went, some of them went from, uh, like, outside of the normal range, which is depending on the scale, is above 4 or 5% fat. Yeah. Some, of them, some of them went from... You know, they drop from above that to below that to like a, what a healthy normal range is yeah. like dropping up to seven. I mean, the BIM group drop up to up to 7% fat fractures. This is big. This is a big drop. So, um, so again, there's, uh, these are just other metabolic effects that were healthy. And you'd expect that if they yeah. lost that much body fat mass, they're losing it everywhere. You're not just losing it from subcutaneous and the fat that you can see like around your body they're losing it in their organs the really dangerous fat yeah. that's accumulating in their organs right so that's that's actually just a note that that's going on and they controlled for all of that like visceral fat versus um subcutaneous fat like all of this other stuff just to see if there's like a difference between men and women yeah. too so they, they they got quite detailed with that type of measurement which you know give them credit for all of that um adverse events were the same in both groups so it you know, muscle spasms were 
that and diarrhea were like but that's kind of things that with your GIT like that's kind of normal yeah. but 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 they were it it's not like the drug was any different than the placebo group um so anyways this the the instructive nature here is something's going on with lean mass that has something to do with being able to lose fat mass now in in specific though cuz this is what catches me in m- most likely obese diabetics that are controlled but very high HbA1c levels. So how does that translate? That'd be my question. Well, I mean, not that that group's inconsequential. I mean, it's it's an important group, but No. Yeah. Well, I mean, I obviously I'm interested like what that means for us. Also, not non-diabetics. Yeah. Like would that be useful for us in the future now or in the future yeah. anyone anyone who's like, well, or how about this? People who are just taking semaglutide to lose weight is this in the future something better than that? Yeah, because like, it causes weight loss on its own, or is it compounding? Do you take the two of them together? And yeah. well, I think that's where these people, that's where these pharmaceutical companies. Yeah, are. this is this would be the absolute home run if you put them together. Yeah, theoretically, if you theoretically again, it, this is way theoretical, but if you can combine this with maybe semaglutide or terzepatide, and maybe reduce the dose of both so you kind of oh, reduce the potential side yeah, because uh, semaglutide effects. has those like GI side effects, right? Yeah. yeah. But if but if if some maybe you could, you know, and they you go there's like a four or five level uh levels of of semaglutide and zepatide till you get the active dose. But what if in the future you could use a much lower dose of that plus a um a lower dose of this and the two put together have some compounding effect cuz they cuz they seem to be working completely on different mechanisms like just nothing to do with each yeah. other but if but if they both can produce um significant fat loss and if this particular drug added to it or a drug like this um mitigates any lean muscle mass loss remember these people aren't working out no, yeah like they're not with weights anyways they're just told to go for walks so this is your workout in the um, and i well kind of oh wait with this I trial think just... done by hemisfield Stephen B. Hemisfield? No, I don't. I don't Looks, know. Okay, I'm a fan. I, I was so. looking. I, I yeah. His. I was looking at other research with his stuff. I love his stuff. Let's see. I'm not. I'm not sure if he's. He's in actually here or a not. lot of um, Adonis Venus stuff because he. Oh yeah, he's the he's the lead author. Yeah. So he did a lot of like the yeah. ratios work, right? And the mm-hmm. you know yeah. uh, what does it mean to have large legs and large circumferences? Yeah. So we've him and, referenced uh, it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. A lot. A lot. Yeah. So yeah, he's actually the lead author okay. here. So there you go. Um, but anyways, so this is where I think, again, and this was the, the thrust of the article that was sent to me, which brought this to my attention, was are these companies angling for this, which it seems like they are. Um, now, this stuff has been around um, maybe, and, and again, obviously this trial started in 2017, so it's not like they waited for the new sort of hype around semaglutide to do this. This was going on already, but obviously they knew they had something with semaglutide and terzepatide and liraglutide and whatever other ones are in the pipeline they knew something was working there and they probably connected the dots pretty quickly that this could be the next thing you see the um, go with it lipids oh yeah yeah hdl went down in the bim group and lp ldl went up triglycerides the same interesting see here yeah i don't know if those are significant doesn't seem to say but well, sorry, what did you just say? HDL went down? HDL went down, LDL went up. I don't think it was giant jumps by any means. So like, so not actually the better direction? No. Yeah, in, well. In either, oh, LDL went down the placebo group. <laughs> it's just, yeah, well, you know. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's just, it's just weird that some of these numbers are going, like, directions that don't make any sense in the placebo group. Like, why would anything change? Yeah. So, anyways, um... The point here was the insulin sensitivity yes. through this through this mechanism of maintaining muscle mass, which to me is pretty shocking that they lost 16 on average pounds of fat mass. That's like that's, a lot. Is... But again, I'm picturing someone who doesn't have that much to lose. I guess, I guess that's an average, yeah. right? I wish we had the data on every single yeah. person, but that's an average. So... I guess if you graph that average onto some of the people in the study who could have been 250, 260 pounds, 16 pounds of fat, yeah, it's nice, but it, I mean, 
visually, you probably and where was tell. Like, I so mean, hold on. The, there was more men in the place, place, uh, placebo, placebo group. Yeah. So, so if you're losing the mass yeah. amount of yeah, okay, yep. And you you got well, to think so, that the dietary recommendations were similar for both. So that's that is impressive. Yeah, all of that was controlled. Well, as best as they could. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure they just told them like, don't work out with weights because that would that would confound the entire the whole, study. Yeah, whole thing. Like, yeah. Like you cannot just start lifting weights in the middle of this. Otherwise, all of these results are completely meaningless. Like they all have to just, again, you can't, you, this is the case where you're just trusting them. Yeah. You don't have them in the lab. You don't know what they're doing at home. You're just hoping what they're doing at home is, is what they've been told to do and nothing more. Right. right? So That's fascinating, man. Um, so it is interesting. They're going towards <clears throat> the lean mass maintenance as a as a target it's interesting they're using i don't want to call them orphan drugs but something they were looking at for sarcopenia that didn't work then but is working now in this population and then it, it definitely shows a a connection between lean mass and insulin sensitivity and we just don't know what direction that is so did the myostatin inhib inhibition cause lean mass to go up and insulin sensitivity to improve or did it cause insulin sensitivity to improve and thus lean mass to go up that'll be that'd be cool to look at yeah i mean i guess i guess the assumption is since it's blocking what they assume to be muscle growth stop genes yeah and lean mass went up they could i mean if you were going to bet you'd bet that it went that direction yeah, i agree the increase in the lean mass caused the sensitivity not sensitivity causing the increase in lean so mass. for all you type I mean, 2 diabetics out there maybe could be something another reason to lift weights well uh, yeah right and uh, the next cool study but these guys don't care yeah. um, that i want to know is if you just took this exact same protocol and added one more wing of people who worked out but didn't take this drug with the weight training after 48 weeks have similar better worse effects so i would have another drug. wing of people doing the exact same protocol but on trt all right. Well, then I'd, I'd add another wing. <laughs> yeah. Well, the the the, th the this immediately got me thinking. All right, so that's pretty cool. But three pounds seems doable to me for weight training protocol in forty eight yeah. weeks. If if they're naive to weight training, I'd expect ten. Yeah. Easy. Well, Easy. I guess then you have the question then it, of Mark Tonopolsky's creatine and dextrose study was eight pounds of lean mass. So does that count? Right. So yeah. I mean the amount the. I would love to see if this if you could compound the lean mass effect here and the oh um mm. the compound the lean mass effect the insulin sensitivity effect plus the body fat mass loss effect like you said combine it just with semaglutide and weight training yeah. combine it with t t TRT for the men anyways and weight training hell just TR first do it with TRT without weight yep. training then add weight training yep. And then semaglutide, uh, BIM, TRT, plus weight training. I mean, I bet you you push some of these, a lot of these people right back to normal. They'd look great and they'd be uh, getting off of all of their diabetic meds. I mean, I'm just guessing, but again, assuming people can get to the habit of weight yeah. training. Maybe, maybe this the whole, the whole point of all, right. And maybe the whole point of it is, is they just know people aren't going to. They're just not going to wait. Yeah, for you know what? Like it, <clears throat> uh, Stu Phillips was just talking about the fact that it's, it's still such a startlingly low number. Like you see everyone on Instagram, but that's such a small representation of the rest of the world, right? That it's so little people still mm -hmm. lift weights. Yeah, I have to keep reminding myself we're just surrounded by yeah. that. So to me, it just to me, weight training just is always going to be a part of it. And but not they, these people know like no nobody weights trains not not. Not enough to even consider it a viable population to sell anything to. Yeah. Like this. Yeah. Like this is going to go to mil – this is for millions and millions and millions of people who are diabetic, struggling with it, even if they try a semaglutide and things improve, but then they start losing lean mass, and they're like, well, what do I do now? Like, so to you and me, the obvious thing is go to the gym and lift weights. Yeah. But if that's just never going to happen, this is better than nothing. <laughs> Like this is better than not doing it. If it, it does act through the active and receptor, then it would also be interesting to look and see what else – like does the active interceptor affect reproductive organs? Like you know, you'd have to go through and 
Well, then then would start the whole all of that yeah, stuff, yeah. right? Like all of the different things they did. They did say they identified actin activin receptors on on uh, fat tissue itself. So okay. I mean, some of the, some of the preliminary research in animals, anyways, show that it activates brown fat. Everything like it increases that. the amount of. <laughs> It increases the amount of brown fat and activates it, which is the fat that could potentially increase your um, yeah your metabolic rate. So I mean, there's different mechanism as to why it could have. I mean, they just say it. They're just like we're not really sure how this causes so much fat fat mass mm -hmm. loss. So yeah, it, it we don't know. There might be something there. Um, the interesting thing is what I would guess based on the fat fact that the um, placebo group. Didn't lose any weight at all. Yeah. Given the exact same diet advice and counseling, yep, counseling advice, my guess is they were eating, well, quite evidently at energy balance. So they weren't gaining anymore, but they weren't losing. So somehow they arrived at like maintenance, energy maintenance of, of the amount of food they yeah. ate. So assuming all things equal and the instructions were the same for both groups. Pretty impressive. Yeah. Um, you would think, you would think that the group who lost, uh, you know, on average, 16 pounds and gained three and a half pounds of lean mass. We're also eating at maintenance. Yeah. I think you'd have to, right? Right. Because the placebo group sort of proves that if they, assuming, assuming a heterogeneous mix of people that all were told the same thing and they all kind of must have followed the protocol more or less the same, mm -hmm. we have to assume, then they probably ate at maintenance too. And they still lost a ton of fat mass and gained some lean mass. So that's like, that's huge. Like that's super huge if that's true. Yeah. So, um, so I mean, interesting, really interesting. If this has any legs at all, and it can get to phase three, and it's it's it's, you know, the safety profile looks good, and and they're gonna, uh, my guess is they're this is already going to another level of research yeah. here. Now the bad news, um, everyone, this, is just how long phase three takes. You will see BIM <laughs> rip off supplements online years before you see this stuff. Right, yeah. right. But if this is a thing, yeah. and it's. And it and it you know can be re validated with the, some more trials. This could be the next thing coming, Absolutely. and it could be, you know, I would guess this is going to be a, some sort of stack in the future where they're sold together, either in the same shot or uh, prescribed as a as a two step system, mm -hmm. and could be could be quite quite potent. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I have a couple other notes here saying it, the inflammation pathway itself. Okay, cool might be inhibiting muscle growth. We've talked about that with inflammation theory, and we mm -hmm. just recently talked about that with um, anabolic fasting. The idea of tr fasting after workout is that the that inflammation, since workouts cause inflammation in and of themselves, that excess inflammation after mm -hmm. that may be blocking that signal, right? So right, right. we've definitely gone deep on that, and that tends to be one of the theories we've been running with for a while now, so interesting. Mm -hmm. So that, that could be part of what, is happening here is somehow it's it's um mitigating that inflammation that is kind of getting in the way of muscle yeah. being maintained or even growing further um some of that research you know gets into some of the cancers that cause muscle wasting have also been shown to signal uh infl inflammation and uh interacting with this pathway as right. well so actually maybe stimulating uh myostatin and the other things that do cause muscle wasting actually like promoting oh, it more stop signs yeah. 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 More stop signs instead of mm -hmm. less, which is fucking cancer. Yeah. Anyways. Um, so, <laughs> well, what can you, yeah. I, anyways. Yeah. Um, so really interesting. So how do we wrap this up? Here? Just, it's, it's interesting research that we are, we are about to learn a lot more about, um, the mechanical biomechanical pathways behind development of lean mass. And it's an area that has been mm -hmm. lacking despite the thousands not thousands, hundreds and hundreds of studies on protein and weight training etc and even testosterone i think this will really highlight the very specific mechanism and pathways associated with lean mass that hopefully then will help us improve our understanding of how diet and exercise can also affect lean mass how about that yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. it works for me so it could be it could be another interesting drug on the horizon but it also informs informs us it, it's another piece of information that informs us if we never are even in the category to ever use this it's uh, the more we learn about preserving lean, lean mass the better no matter how we arrive there at that understanding yeah. yep beauty all right so i think that's a good place yeah. to leave it for today so yep so for brad peel i'm john barbin and that's your five life podcast <laughs>